good to see each one of you tonight. Take those song books, hymn number 34. She's playing it there, Living by Faith in Jesus Above. Hymn number 34, let's stand together. I care not today what tomorrow may bring. I'm going to live for the Lord and serve Him by faith. Let's sing it together. I care not today what tomorrow may bring, if shadow or sunshine or rain. The Lord I know ruleth for everything, and all of my worry is vain. Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From all harm safe in His sheltering arms, I'm living by faith and feel no alarm. I know He will safely carry me. I know that He safely will carry me through. Matter what evil be tied. Why should I then care though the tempest may blow if Jesus walks close by my side? Living by faith in Jesus above, trusting, confiding in His great love. From a harm safe in His sheltering arm, I'm living by faith. Hymn number 303, if you would, as we walk by faith through this life, we're on our way to heaven. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast that wishful eye. We'll sing it on that very first verse. Hymn number 303. On Jordan's stormy banks I stand and cast a wishful eye. Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come? Go with me. I am bound for the prom. That last verse, when shall I reach? When shall I reach that happy place? Be forever blessed. When shall I see my Father's face and in His bosom? Sing that chorus now. I am bound for the promised land. I am bound for the promised land. Oh, who will come and go with me? I am bound for the promised land. Thank you. you. May be seated and thank you for coming tonight. I feel led to do this right at the very beginning of the service. Most of you have uh, been watching or you know a little bit about the uh, Uvalde, Texas school shooting and uh, 21 dead there, 19 students and two teachers. It is a grim scene there. And uh, I want us to take just a moment to have a moment of silence for these families and uh, for these children, those that lost their lives and those that witnessed all this bloodshed. Let's pray as we take a moment of silence. Let's pray for our nation. Our nation uh, has lost much of its heart. And only the Lord knows what we have down the road for us. But it is so sad. And let's ask for God's grace and mercy on these families. Just take a moment to do that. And we'll sing a chorus together. Father, we come to you tonight asking for grace and mercy on these families and these children. We know nothing else to pray that your presence would be made known there. You would handle these grieving mothers and fathers and family members and friends. 
We ask you, please, to bless those first responders, especially the officers that stopped the killing. And um, we ask that you be close to those who are making decisions even tonight. And then, Father, we pray for our nation that she'll come to grips with her inner soul. That we would see a sweeping revival. That even liberal thinkers would say, enough is enough. May we somehow begin to recra- recapture this nation that was once one nation under God. Tonight our flags on this property fly at half staff for these. And I pray that our prayers will be heard in Uvalde, Texas tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Brother Pearson, lead us in a prayer course. Would you do that? Let's sing together that song, I Need Thee Every Hour. I need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. No tender voice like thine can peace afford. I need thee, oh, I need thee. I need thee, oh bless me now my Savior, I come to thee. Amen. Let's keep these families and this whole situation in our prayers this week, and they sure need those. It's good to have uh, uh, Brother Salyer with us tonight, and uh, we're going to ask him to come, and Brother Mike... And his family is here. He'll, he'll introduce them. They are missionaries to the Philippines. And this is the same mission board that uh, Brother Danny Whetstone oversees. And we're so thankful for him. By the way, we did get uh, our, our missions conference scheduled for the fall as far as the people coming. Dr. King will open us up on Sunday. And Brother Whetstone will continue the meeting. And so we're looking forward to all that. So you're in Brother Whetstone's church. So we're glad you're here. Let's give a good welcome to Brother Salyer. God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for having us here. We know this is a very historic church among independent Baptists, so I thank you so much. Uh, we were also in Pastor uh, Bob Vrandenberg's church just two weeks ago, so I know he's out of this church. This is my wife, Heather, of 28 years. I met her in church. Always a great place to meet your wife. Uh, number four son, Jameson Salyer. Number five son, Micah. And uh, we are church planters to the island of Beliran, that is in the central part of the Philippines, uh, very historic. That area is where Douglas MacArthur came to liberate the Philippines. He said, I shall return. And we've been to that place too. So we'll go ahead and get right into the video and then we'll uh, finish. The Philippines is described as the Pearl of the Orient. Over 7,000 islands make up the Philippines and 2,000 of them are inhabited by people. These islands have many natural waterfalls, beautiful mountains, geothermal hot springs, coral reefs, and coasts. The Philippines have a total population of 102 million people. The Filipino people exhibit warm hospitality to visitors and are generous and respectful. They also believe in having strong family values. The two official languages are Filipino, which is called Tagalog, and English, which is taught in the public schools. We are the Salyers. I'm Heather. I'm Jameson. And I'm Micah. And my name is Mike, and God has called us to the Philippines, and more specifically, the island of Beliran. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 16, 9, For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. On our first trip to the island of Beleren, me and my wife Heather were passing out booklets of John and Romans. We were approached by a Roman Catholic priest, and he asked me what I was doing. I told him that I was passing out copies of John and Romans, and he yelled out of his window, You're wasting your time. We know that we're not wasting our time. We can trust God's word. And Isaiah 55:11 says, 
It shall not return unto me void, but it shall accomplish that which I please. We have three goals to accomplish in Beliran. The first goal is to plant a church in the island of Beliran. And we pray that that church will plant many more churches in Beliran and throughout the Philippines. The Bible says in Matthew 16, 18, And upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The opportunities are numerous on the island of Beliran. On a previous survey trip, we've been able to pass out Bibles and John and Romans to the university in Naval. We've been also been able to give out New Testaments to the jail in Naval, the capital city. Also, we've been able to give candies, Bibles, and toys to the kids in an elementary school. We have also visited the neighboring islands of Higatangan and Mary Pipi. While there, we passed out Bibles and New Testaments and talked to their leaders. There are many adversaries in the Philippines, such as communism, Roman Catholicism, and Islam. The cults are also growing in great numbers, such as the Jehovah Witnesses and the Latter-day Saints. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.11, Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. It is our duty as Christians to persuade men here and abroad. Our second goal will be to start a Bible Institute through the church in Beliran to teach young men and church members the Word of God. The Great Commission says in Matthew 28, 20, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. Our third goal in our ministry is Bible distribution. In Psalm 68, 11 says, The Lord gave the word, great was the company of those that published it. We as Christians are all to proclaim and publish the word of God. We are here at Plain Path Publishers in Columbus, North Carolina, a ministry of our church, Crossroads Baptist Church. Here, Brother Gary Maldener and many church members assemble John and Romans and coloring books in the Gospel of John to send to missionaries and national pastors in the Philippines. Our family, the Salyers, have been able to send 10,000 pounds of Bibles, tracts, John and Romans to national pastors in the Philippines, and to God be the glory. My sons, Jameson and Micah, enjoy correlating booklets of John and Romans. They also enjoy packing the boxes that we sent to the national pastors. The need is great. I have over 40 addresses of national pastors that desire greatly Bibles, John and Romans, and tracts. Will you pray with us that we can meet that need? I'm Nathan Dietrich, pastor of the Crossroads Baptist Church, Columbus, North Carolina. It's been our privilege for nine years now to have Mike and Heather Salyer along with their family as faithful members of Crossroads Baptist Church. They've been involved in many aspects of the ministry here, but the common denominator in their life has been their undying burden for the Philippines, and in particular now the island of Beliran. And really this is one of the great evidences that this is the call of God on their life. He wants them in the Philippines to labor for Him there in that part of the white harvest field. Would you consider financial support for them? And I can say with full assurance that any missions dollars that you invest in the Salyers ministry in the Philippines will result in fruit abounding to your account. May God bless you as you faithfully serve the Lord in your part of the harvest field. Would you please pray for us? For an effective ministry. For more Bibles to be sent. For us to be used as tools for God's purpose. And that souls would be saved on the island of Beliran. Thank you so much. Uh, and I'd like to encourage you all to take a missions trip. Even y'all right here. It'll really change your life. And I've been to Haiti five times and the Philippines five times and I can't wait to get back. Um, as we just stated before, our, our main goal is to plant a church. And uh, I've seen this um, uh, demonstration, where, not demonstration, but this strategy where you plant one church, a mother church, and have a school within that church and uh, then train your, te uh, your people and um, young men to be pastors and missionaries. The Filipinos are great people. Um, they are willing to be missionaries and uh, the Philippines has less than 1% Baptist, but that 1% really wants to go out and serve the Lord. They are interested to be missionaries to Asia, 
uh, Taiwan, Laos, Cambodia. They have a great uh, burden for Asia. And some of them have gone to Africa. Uh, so we want to plant a church uh, on the island of Balearin and plant churches in the different cities in the two um, satellite islands. There's about 200,000 people there. And not only just focusing on our island, we want to broaden our scope to uh, help national pastors. We have a lot of great uh, resources in the United States, a lot of great printing ministries, and have been able to uh, reach out to them and to pack uh, these boxes to send to them, and they uh, really, really need that. Um, just as in the Ukraine, we're sending bullets to the Ukrainians, and we need to send um, Bibles and tracts to fundamental uh, Baptist national pastors so they can reach their Jerusalem. And uh, also uh, starting a Bible Institute. I'm looking forward to that so I can learn more. Um, just briefly, I got a few minutes here, uh, just four landmarks in my life of how we have got to this point. Um, grandparents, we are grandparents on deputation. So I've been five months on full-time deputation and the Lord's just miraculously taking care of us. And uh, my first landmark in my life was getting involved in my local church in my 20s. And our pastor from college said, when you get home, get involved in your local church. And that's what I did. And they put me to work in uh, Midland, Michigan, Calvary Baptist Church. We started a bus ministry there. And we had uh, over eight, uh, the first, it was in the winter, dead of winter, January. And we had 14 riders and eight got saved. And that just really changed my life. And eight years of that. And then we moved to North Carolina, uh, teaching junior church for another 14 years. And... Uh, then bus and then bus structure again until the Lord got a hold of my heart in my 40s and uh, then I surrendered to go to the Philippines. Um, so getting involved in the local church. The second thing was is getting involved in faith promise missions. In our 30s uh, we really were always faithful in our tithe. Though we being from Michigan coming down south we didn't really understand grace giving or faith promise missions. Uh, but Dr. Whetstone came to our church in Zebulon preached on it and we decided to do it and uh, just changed our life. I would say that would be a landmark. And I uh, just saw the Lord blessing as I was working and I was a pest control operator and just working on commission and just see the Lord just blessing our lives through that. And the third thing was the surrender. I really never knew how to surrender, but we did after going to the Philippines on a missions trip and uh, seeing uh, children get saved and we saw an adult get saved and I said this is what we really want to do. The Lord showed me and then I got home and told my wife and she says well I got some news for you and I said I got some news for you too and she said she was pregnant with Jameson and I told her at age my age 42 for me that we're going to be missionaries so uh, two great uh, announcements there. Uh, God showed us to go to Ambassador Baptist College and I spent the next years work, six years working on my master's I didn't know I was going to have to take Greek and Hebrew, but uh, we got through that. <laughs> so, uh, and the fourth thing is just trusting God for our daily needs um, right now. Philippians 4.19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. And the Lord's teaching us that too, where Dr. Weston again said, make deputation your job. So I quit in January. We used up all of our savings through school. We had one meeting in January and one meeting in February and um, stepping on a deputation, but the Lord just miraculously met our needs. Uh, so thank you so much, and Pastor, thank you. Brother, you, you have a, uh, a display set up out there. I believe, it, uh, I believe I saw it on the way through there. So let's make sure we uh, visit the table afterward and uh, greet the Salyers and meet them. I thought it was really neat on the video. One of the boys, I think it was Jameson, may not have been one of the two, but he said that, that they were praying that God would use them as a tool to reach those in the Philippines. That's exactly what each one of us needs to be, a tool that God can use to reach those around us. Let's stand together and let's sing something along those same lines. Channels only, blessed master. Being a channel, a useful tool that God can use to reach those around the world and in our Jerusalem. We'll dismiss our teens as we sing it on the first verse. Hymn number 496, sing it on that first. How I praise thee, precious Savior, that thy love laid hold of me. 
Thou hast saved and cleansed and filled me, that I might thy channel be. Channels only, blessed Master, but with all thy wondrous power. Throwing through us, thou canst use us every day and every that last verse, Jesus fill now, Jesus fill now with thy spirit, hearts that full surrender know, that the streams of living water from our inner man may flow, channels only, blessed master, but with all thy wondrous power, flowing through us, thou canst use us every day and every hour. Announcements here I'll go right into our prayer time. Uh, I want to announce, um, y'all have that slide ready up there, Patriotic Sunday, June the 26th. And I want to show you a picture right here. We got our speaker and um, we're so thankful to have Pastor Dwight Thomason scheduled to speak for us on that day. He's not been to Franklin Road Baptist Church. He knows all about our church. I've known him for years. Uh, he was, uh, I'll show the next picture there. He's a Vietnam a veteran. This is actually his uh, part of his platoon that he was in. And I'll save all the story for him when he gets here. But you will enjoy hearing him speak. And uh, he is a delightful speaker. Brother Gibbs will be with us next year. And so we had a scheduling conflict there. And so looking forward to hearing, you're going to meet a new friend right here, Brother Dwight Thomason. And so I want you to be praying about that meeting. Let's be inviting folks. You get, your, uh, you get your uniform out. I told him, I said, could you wear your dress blues? He said, if you want to preach on skinny jeans, I can wear my dress blues. <laughs> so he's trying to get down to fight and wait before that happens. Uh, he said, it don't count on a preacher. It doesn't look very good for the home team. However, uh, he pastored for years in Newport Beach, California. When he retired, turned it over to one of the men there. Uh, he started mission work. He'd already started somewhat. He started mission work over in Southeast Asia. Uh, he goes to other countries, but he actually works with nationals in that arena right where he fought. And very, very strange, similar to what Brother Rick Horn did. Brother Rick Horn fought in Vietnam, and he went back over to that area in Thailand and worked up into Laos and, and Burma and those areas and uh, Cambodia and so I thought that is noble so we'll hear about that Lord willing on Sunday night the 26th I don't mark that down and let's let's be planning on having a big day that day you guys and ladies that uh, can wear your uniforms let's wear them on that day and let's have a big day also by way of announcement bus meeting tonight will be in the choir room uh, so if you'll assemble over there we have a wedding shower coming up for Nathan Lyons and Caitlin Sweat this Sunday it'll be a walk-through shower at six o'clock before service and then afterwards as well uh, and they're registered at Bed Bath & Beyond Williams Sonoma and Amazon usually you can pick up a gift card or maybe just bring something a gift along in an envelope and a card let's be a blessing to them uh, this Sunday night uh, parents of teens meeting this Sunday night on the on, excuse me on the fifth, June 5th and then June the 6th ladies I hope you're signed up for this gonna be a big night ladies night out a garden party under the tent uh, here on the property, June 6, 630, and uh, there's no cost, but please sign up at um, frbc.com or at the information desk out here. No child care for this event, and a, 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 a full meal, catered meal out uh, coming in, and you'll enjoy the meal. I already heard the menu, and I may be uh, a helper to make sure the tent doesn't fall in just to be a part of that you're going to enjoy it that will be uh 6 30 monday june 6 teen summer camp coming up june 6 through 10 make sure you get your teenagers signed up for that and then vacation bible school june 13 through 15 and uh it's in the morning from 9 to 12 and wednesday night is a big night we'll have the food trucks in it's going to be a big bridge event we'll be praying about all of that and then uh Ask God to bless there. Uh, if I could just meet with our deacons just briefly up here tonight. It won't take five minutes. One quick question for you tonight. We're praying for these this evening. And I want you to jot these down. And uh, let's be praying. Let's pray for Eva Bruner. This is the Johansson's daughter. And it looks like uh, 
uh, hospice. It will be coming in. They're gathering the family in. And let's just pray for this family uh, and ask God to bless and encourage them tonight. Let's keep the children in the Uvalde, Texas shooting in our prayers. Anderson Dickey is home, recovering from surgery. And then Carol Thomas is Bonnie Camp's sister and is facing some cancer surgery there. And Billy Wright is Catherine Manet's grandfather. He is in the hospital. I think he has sepsis. septus. And uh, they may have to remove his leg. He's 88 years old. Let's pray for him. Praying for Bill Lyons. This is Kate Schmidt's brother in the hospital up in Kentucky with a stroke. And then also praying for Matt and Peter Hayes' grandmother, Lorena Hayes, uh, has had congestive heart failure up in the Rockford, Illinois area. And we learned right before church that Brother Gary Damesworth has had a motorcycle accident down in Florida. As you know, um, Gail and them, they live up here, but he's down there working some of his son, Eric. He was out on a motorcycle today, and uh, a truck moved over on him, and he tried to avoid the truck, and he wrecked his motorcycle. Pray particularly for his leg. It's severely damaged. They're going to have to do surgery on it. Uh, they're on, doing a CAT scan right now as we speak to see if there's any other damage there. The pain medication they're giving him is making him very ill. If you pray about all that, I know that Gail would appreciate that. Linnea just happened to be home, and she called me, and Gail was flying down there tonight to be with him. So let's pray about all of that. Let's keep uh, uh, Becky Fredericks in our prayers as she heals up. Brother Milford Bushow as well. Let's pray for Nancy Dreyer. She told me Sunday she's facing yet another back surgery. And then also for Ryan Kiefer. Uh, as he recovers from his portion of his leg being amputated, ask God to bless there. And then also for C Scott Carlson, uh, the, uh, he is home from the hospital. This is Justin Byers' uh, friend, or cousin, I mean to say. He had a brain tumor, and we're praying for him. He's home now from the hospital. Let's keep him in our prayers. Well, Westland Powell's granddaughter, as you recall, Westland's daughter's little grandbaby uh, suddenly died and uh, two years old, and the service will be this Friday at 2.30, and we'll give you the location uh, on that real soon. Also, let's keep little Chloe Parsons in our prayers. Ask God to bless there, and also for Randy Robinson, Jackie's brother, tumor on his throat, and test coming up on the 7th. Our men are coming for the offering, and as they're coming, let's not forget to uh, be praying for the, the announcement of the Roe v. Wade decision from the Supreme Court. And we thought that happened this Monday. We were told that. It didn't. God's in control of all that. And uh, then also, let's pray for the World Health Organization to see decision that our government would not surrender our national medical sovereignty to the World Health Organization. Please pray about that. Let's ask God to bless. I see Phil Wheeler back there, brother. Good to be home from the old dusty trail. Good to have you back. And how many did you have saved this past week? Do you know? Nine saved. Let's keep him in our prayers. We're thanking God for every one of those. Brother Seth, with an F. It's not. You pray for us. Yes, sir. Let's bow together. Heavenly Father, come before you tonight. We're grateful that we can come before you, the almighty God of the universe, the creator of all. And Lord, you hear us. I thank you, God, that you don't turn a deaf ear to us and nor a blind eye, but you see all and you hear all, and you're well aware of all that happened in our country with this terrible tragedy, and Lord, you are aware of the debauchery within our government, and Lord, you know how we would turn our back on you as a country, and yet, Lord, you are merciful to us, and you are ever gracious, and you still continue to bless this nation because of the remnant of Christians within it. I pray you'd help us as a church to remain a light and the salt and never give in, Lord, to the wickedness of the world. I pray that you'd be with uh, Father. Our upcoming special patriotic service will have guests on the property and veterans and those who have served in our country. May we as a, as a body of believers uh, support them. It shows some honor to those who have sacrificed. Lord, several folks tonight we have on our request that need your help with their physical problems. Eva Bruner, Lord, and uh, Carol Thomas and Billy Wright. Lord, Bill Lyons with his throat cancer and uh, 
uh, Lorena Hayes with heart failure, Brother Games Damesworth, Lord, with this motorcycle accident and uh, his leg injuries. Think of Becky Becky Fredericks tonight and Nancy Dreyer, Brother Ryan Kiefer, who has had a recent amputation and recovering from that, and his father as well, recovering from his surgeries. And Scott Carlson, Lord, and we think of Weston Powell and her daughter and the loss of this little child. Continue to give grace and mercy to them as they deal with this loss. And Chloe Parson, Father, still having health problems. Lord, we know that uh, in the near future, our Supreme Court will face some decisions. Uh, Lord, may they rule in favor of truth and righteousness, not only emotion or the cry of the mob. I pray, God, that we would again turn our hearts away from the abortion that our country has supported for so long. God, I pray as well for the leadership within our, our federal government that would seek to hand over our sovereignty uh, to a one world order, uh, Lord, with the health. And God, we just, we, we shudder to see things happening before our very eyes that seem to show the dismantling of our country. And God, we don't know what the end game will be for America before you return. But Lord, whatever it is, may we shine as lights and may we be faithful to you no matter how dark the world is around us. Help us all, Lord, to continue to uh, reach out to those we come in contact with to be examples and Lord, to give the gospel and to spread the, the love of Jesus to our community. We thank you for this church and what it represents. May we all jump on board and help with our vacation Bible school as we will see hundreds and hundreds of young people on our property. And uh, well, that'll represent many families as well that aren't associated with our church. And may we see many folks saved through that bridge event. And Lord, may we see uh, families uh, join the church as well through that. Lord, tonight give us your grace, be with our pastor as he preaches, filled with the Spirit of God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Joseph went to Pilate to beg for the body of a man that so many despised. It was a cold, still form they carried from the mountain to the tomb where they laid him inside. The chief priest came to Pilate, saying, Sir, do you remember that Jesus said in three days he would rise? Pilate said, Go seal the tomb, make it as sure as you can. But all the guards could not hold him inside. The stone was rolled away, the rock of ages walked out, the lily bloomed in all his glory so fair. At sunrise the sun rose in glory and power, and one day soon we will meet him in the air. hope not only in this life uncertain Jesus promised that one day we'll live again that's the hope that we cherish though this body may perish and glorified we will rise to live with him when the stone was rolled away, the rock of ages walked out. The lily bloomed in all his glory so fair. At sunrise the sun rose in glory and power, and one day soon we will meet. 
the stone was rolled away, the rock of ages walked out. The lily bloomed in all his glory so fair. At sunrise the sun rose in glory. Amen. Thank you for that good song. Did you catch that phrase? When the stone was rolled away, the rock of ages walked out. That was pretty good. And the sun rise, the sun rose. I like that. Let's take our Bibles, please, and turn to the book of 1 Thessalonians. We have been telling you we're going to start a series, and we're going to dive into it tonight. And I uh, want you to maybe have a pen and something out to take some notes. I will preach slash teach some. And um, I... I uh, I'm thinking about the times that we're in and the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. And so I have a lot of jobs. One is to get us ready to meet the Lord. And so uh, I want you to uh, turn to 1 Thessalonians. Let's stand together, please. I'll read just 10 verses here and take a text verse and uh, pick up reading verse number 1 of uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 1. Paul and Silvanus, that's the Latin name for Silas, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus, under the church of, Thessal of these Thessalonians, or the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. We give thanks to God always for you all. He was southern there for y'all. We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love and patience of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. Knowing, brethren, beloved, your election of God, for our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance as ye know what manner of men we were among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that we were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in the Macedonia, but, or excuse me, Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were is spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. For they, they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Let's read as our text verse, verse number 9. Let's read that out loud together. Or excuse me, verse number 10. Verse 10. Let's read that together out loud. Ready? And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have you be seated. Uh, and then I want to explain a couple of things. We'll pray. I'm going to start a series tonight entitled this whole series, A Picture of a Prepared Church. A picture of a prepared church. And we're going to try to do First and Second Thessalonians together. Tonight's uh, message is titled, The Importance of Church Reputation. The Importance of Church Reputation. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for your word tonight. And thank you for the chance we have to deliver it, teach it, preach it, and hear it uh, in freedom this evening. And I pray your blessings on us. You know what my heart purpose is in all this. And I pray our church family will get in on it and learn some things and do all they can to be ready to see you face to face someday because we believe you are coming again. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now what I'm going to do tonight is I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have to kind of talk fast so I'll st stick pretty close to my notes. I'm going to give you a quick little overview 
And then I want to introduce these first 10 verses. And we'll actually get into our subject in just a moment. Now, I'm one of these guys. Uh, preacher, you went to the same kind of Bible college I went to where they teach you how to milk your own cow and tell, tear the Bible apart. Uh, and I went to that kind of Bible college. So I'm, I'm going to, as I was reading the scripture out loud just a moment ago, I kept seeing words that I feel like I need to preach on. So I'm going to kind of pull back from that and, and try not to pull the graffiti off the walls of my brain. But I'm going to give you a quick little overview. There's much more I can say. And then I'm going to kind of move into the purpose uh, of um, the, this particular topic and why we're in this book. And then an introduction and dive into it. So I'm going to read a lot and dive in on this thing. The Apostle Paul visited this city during his second missionary journey. And the account of his time there is found in Acts 17 verses 1 through 12. You can read about it. We'll not take the time to do it tonight. Much can be said about his time there. We cover that at length when we talk through the book of Acts. During Paul's ministry, the Roman Empire ruled the known world, and people fell under the iron fist of Caesar's dynasty. Now, I was listening to Brother Seth pray just a moment ago. How many of you thank God for the freedom we have in America? Oh, you don't know how much that means right now. Nations around the world are losing their freedom. And we're on the cusp when something happens of losing more and more of our freedoms. I understand that when this book was written, it was written during a time of great persecution. And the Thessalon uh, Thessalonica was a seaport town that boasted a population of about 200,000 people. So about the size of Murfreesboro, Tennessee. But it was on a seaport, so a lot of vice came in. They had a very, very vibrant economy. Uh, it, it was also... The city of, uh, uh, capital city of Macedonia, which Macedonia was a Roman province. Uh, as with most, most wealthy cities, it was plagued with a sin and vice and the pagan religion. And as you recall, there was a lot of money that poured into this city. And where there's a, a lot of money, you can expect paganism. As you recall, the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 6 and verse 10, the love of money is the root of all evil. Not money. Matter of fact, I want you all to make a lot of money and provide for your family and give to God. Amen. And missions. Amen. And, uh, but where there's a lot of money and where Christ is void from society, money becomes the God and vice and perversion of all sorts will follow. Allah, San Francisco, uh, Chicago, New York City, and the list goes on and on. And uh, Paul's time there was brief but successful. Most believe he was there less than a month, but he worked night and day. There was a large population of Jews there, and Paul had great success, went into the Christ, but uh, it caused him problems because he was eventually ran out of town by the, those Judaizers that opposed Paul's ministry of the gospel preaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. However, while there, working night and day to win souls and build a work for God, when the dust settled, with the help of Silas, who is mentioned here in verse 1, and Timothy, a vibrant church was started there with a very sizable congregation, a good number of converts, both Jews and Greeks have been baptized. And uh, Timothy and Silas, as believed, went back in. They ran Paul out of town, and they came back in and helped actually set the church up. Now, let me just say a couple things. Uh, uh, Paul felt that he should write them two letters. And we have them by inspiration in our King James Bible. He wanted these letters to encourage them in their success amid the persecution there they experienced uh, under the Jews who were killing them and under the culture of the Roman Empire. Both Paul and the Christians of that generation felt that God's return was imminent. That's very important to this subject. These two books teach us about the imminent return of Jesus Christ. They felt like the persecution they were under was a sign that Jesus Christ was close to his return. Uh, you and I know he's, we're still waiting for him to come back. But both these books are filled with the admonition to prepare for the Lord's return. In fact, every chapter there is, has at least one verse. In these two books, every chapter has at least one verse that mentions the return of Christ. I want to challenge you. Uh, it would be a short read to go home tonight 
or in the morning and read through both these books. It probably wouldn't take you 15 minutes. Have a pen ready and you'll find a verse in every chapter that speaks of the return of God. And so uh, we're very foolish when we live like Jesus will never return. Every generation since the cross has looked for the rapture. Let me say that again. Every generation since the cross has been looking for the rapture. I'm going to stop making a statement right now. Uh, the pre-tribulational, pre-millennial doctrine of the rapture of the church is really being attacked right now. I think there's a reason for that. I think, which, by the way, our, our ministry believes in a pre-trib, pre-mill rapture of the church. In other words, we're rallying here for the tribulation. How many understand that? Say amen. All right. It is really being attacked right now because... Some people, it's, it's, it's part of Satan's plan, some people will be duped into believing that Antichrist is the Christ. If we move off the scene, there'll be an explanation for that. Antichrist moves on the scene, and people will just fall for this guy. He'll be very religious the first three and a half years. And so you need to be careful about that. Just because Christ hasn't returned doesn't mean he's not going to sometime soon. Let me put it to you like this. Uh, the uh, imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ is mentioned throughout the New Testament. I want to take the time to just mention just a few verses, and I'm going to read these to you, but I could take you to 20 right away. Here's one, 1 Peter 4, 7. By the way, listen to how they're worded. Now, these guys were writing in the first century church. We're in 2022 right now. Here's what they said, 1 Peter 4, 7. But the end of all things is at hand. Be therefore sober and watch unto prayer. End of all things are at hand. Boy, if he said that then, how many believe us that we're that much closer? James 5, 7. Be patient, therefore, brethren, under the coming of the Lord. Behold, the husbandman waited for the precious fruit of the earth and hath long patience for it until he received the early and latter rain. Be also patient, establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. Grudge not one against another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold, the judge standeth at the door. They felt like Jesus was right there on the edge of the cloud getting ready to come. Hebrews 10, 25. Not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So over and over and over in Scripture, the imminent return of Jesus Christ is taught. Don't ever back away from that. Jesus Christ can come back before I'm done preaching. He can come back tonight. He can come back in our sleep. He can come back in the morning. Next week, next month, next year, Jesus Christ is coming again. And you and I need to be ready for all that. Uh, again, the apostle Peter admonishes us to purify ourselves and be ready for the rapture. Listen to this. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night in the which the heavens shall pass away with great noise, and the elements shall melt with, with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up, seeing then that all these things shall be dissolved. What manner of persons ought ye be in all, all holy conversation and godliness, looking for and hasting unto the coming of the day of God? He's coming again, and because of that, you and I should purify. And that's what this book is all about. In these uh, uh, books, Paul is trying to get us ready. Now, let me just say this as your pastor. My main job as your pastor is to prepare you for heaven. I don't know if I do a very good job. I know one thing. I try to preach my socks off most, most days. But I do that in three ways. I want you to jot these down. I want you to know my heart as your pastor. What am I doing? Number one, we do it through evangelism. Getting people saved, getting them baptized, teaching you to go win people to Christ, setting, setting a plan for you to lead people to Christ. That's a great commission. It's part of my main job. But the second thing is this. Would you write this down? Worship. Did you know that God desires worship from all his children? Do you know how hard it is to get people in a good place spiritually just so they can worship God in spirit and truth? And by the way, let me just stop and say this. God hates lip service. So you, you got to understand, uh, okay, I'm preaching a series on a, a biblical obedience, getting back to old-fashioned obedience. I, I'm just not chewing my cabbage twice. As a pastor, 
I see people straying from obedience. Maybe I'm too late, but I'm trying to get people back to obeying God. You're not going to have the blessings of God unless you obey him. And uh, trying to get us ready. The third thing, by the way, I want you to come in this place. I'm sorry about my raspy voice. But I want you to come in this place on a, on, a, on a Sunday morning or every service. But Sunday morning and just light this place up in song. And be ready to go and worship God. And, and, and it's part of my job. Lastly is exhortation. Meaning teaching and preaching the word of God. In order to purify the saints and get them ready to meet the Lord in the rapture. This again is a full time job. I spend myself on these things. Apart from, apart from uh, visiting the sick. Uh, helping people who lost loved ones. And weddings and counseling and phone calls. And um, I just feel like I, I never got off the phone all day today. And that's fine. It's part of my job. But this is, where, this, this is my direction. This is my burden. So in these books of the Bible, Paul is doing the same. By inspiration, Paul writes to this church, trying to get them ready to meet the Lord. And I believe these two letters, we have a snapshot of a church that is preparing to meet the Lord in the air. Every church should be doing that. Now, I'm getting ready to give you seven things real quick. But I want to say this. Every church has a reputation. That is noted in the scriptures in several ways, but never better noted than the seven churches of Asia Minor described in Revelation 1 through 3. He talked about Pergamos. He talked about Ephesus. He talked about Philadelphia. He talked about the Laodicea. And he said, uh, he said uh, what he thought about those churches. This church has a reputation. Notice, please, the importance of the reputation of a good church. The Thessalonican church was, number one, an encouraging place. Would you jot that down? It was an encouraging place. Verse one, Paul and Silvanus and Timotheus. Look, notice, please, the men of encouragement. I mean, you couldn't get better men. You had Paul getting started. I mean, he was an, he was a, an orator, a soul winner, a mission statesman. He rose into town. The guy knows what he's doing. You ever been around somebody just confident in their work? And you could tell as soon as they walked on the scene, I mean, this guy knows what he's doing. That was Paul. By the way, those kind of people are always an encouragement to be around. Paul yoked up, first of all, with Barnabas, uh, the son of consolation. It did not work out. So another godly man came around named Silas. And uh, boy, did they make a team. We're talking about two guys that encouraged each other. Sometimes they were locked up together. They encouraged each other. He stuck right with him. And then Timotheus, Timothy couldn't have been a better young preacher rolled into town to encourage a church. Look at the men. I mean, this was an encouraging place. And I want our church to be an encouraging place. I, I want us to be able to encourage those around us. And, and today we had a lot, of, a lot of prayer needs tonight. And, and we ought to encourage each other by taking that list home and praying for those people. And then secondly, the ministry of encouragement. Watch how this is worded. It says, uh, under the church of the Thessalonians, which is, watch this now, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. What's that mean? It's talking about their position, but now we're going to notice uh, the payback for being in God and being in the Lord Jesus Christ. And here it is. Uh, Grace be unto you and peace from, here it is again, God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. What's he saying? He's saying when you walked in this church, they had God all over them. They believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. There was grace there. There was peace there. They were enjoying the peace of God. Watch this now. In the middle of persecution and hardship. Now our gas is heading toward $5 a gallon. Someone says it's near an $8 a gallon in California. And all that's bad. And, and, and no baby formula. And the list goes on and on and on. Uh, not enough fertilizer and for the crops. And you just hear all this stuff. Someone said the other day, there's going to be a shortage of peanut butter. Now, buddy, that right there is going to get us. But, but we say that. It's probably not funny. But the list goes on and on and on. Ladies and gentlemen, that's hardship. But that's not persecution. And in the middle of all that, they had the grace of God. They had the peace of Jesus Christ. And the Bible says, in the middle of this, they turned around and gave thanks. Paul gave thanks always for all of them, making mention of them in his prayers. And so, it was an encouraging place. 
Number two is an exciting place. And I'm zipping through a lot of this. It was an exciting place. Look at verse 3. Remember without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love and patience of hope and in the Lord Jesus Christ in the sight of God our Father. So if you went in there, it's a place of great faith. I think about our last Faith Promise Missions Conference and how we just shot over the top with our giving. By the grace of God, we plan on taking on this mission family in our next meeting. And... um, uh, email, I text message your director today, and I said, send me more. What churches do you know that are in that position right now? Our deacons, we just had our deacons meeting the other night. They love to give away mission money. Uh, just so you know, we're, we're set so good in our meeting last night. We, we uh, voted to give double offerings to our missions this month. Missionaries, all of them. Hey, like that, Josh Ferran. Amen. You got to raise your name to the field yet, and uh, and we're we're tickled to death. I'll say let's do this, and they'll double it, and that's because of your faithful giving to Faith Promise. And so uh, I think it's a place of great faith. I think about some of the stuff God's allowed us to do. Do you know we bought this property next door? We didn't know how we were going to cover that. Do you know now that's been just a few months, and God's put every bit of that money back in our 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 budget, every bit of it. I can't explain that. I didn't do that. I give. But all of you collected, we didn't get no big gifts. But uh, God just put it back in there. It's a place of great faith. It's a place of, of a labor of love that was accepted. Paul and these men came in and worked among them. I mean, a month can go really fast. He worked night and day, but they just drank it in. And they saw the men's, they saw Paul and these men, their labor as a labor of love. They came there because they didn't want them to burn in hell and they accepted all that. Ladies and gentlemen, as, as men of God come in and stand behind this pulpit and understand, they're coming as a labor of love. And uh, most men can do anything in this world. This man gave his testimony of being in secular work before he, God called him to preach and thank God for you. And I pray, may your tribe increase. And I'm just saying, it was a place uh, uh, that they received a labor of love. It was a place of patient hope. They thought Christ was coming back. And, uh, and, and he said, uh, he says in one place, in, in one of the books here, he said they were kind of quitting their jobs, uh, anticipating Christ coming back. And he said, don't you occupy till you come. You keep moving forward. And so, uh, but they patiently waited on the Lord to come, and that's what you and I are going to do. People ask me all the time, Pastor, what am I supposed to do? The world is coming apart. What am I supposed to do? We're going to patiently wait in hope of Jesus Christ. I know so hope of Jesus Christ coming again. It was a place, uh, and by the way, all this, last part of verse 3, all this was under the auspices of an all-seeing Father. It says, in the sight of God our Father. When was the last time you came to church and you understood that Jesus Christ was watching everything you did? And he knew your heart and he knew what you thought. And he knew that if you were critical about something, God sees all that. Well, when you rolled in the church of, of the Thessalonians, I mean, it was a place of faith and love and patient hope. I mean, they just all hit on all cylinders, and they knew that God was watching. Might be a good practice for us coming up this Sunday. Uh, it was number two. It was an accepting place. Verses four and five, uh, he calls them brethren. I think it's one of the sweetest words, brother and sister. We may not use sister enough. Down here in the South, we say miss so-and-so. Everybody's miss so-and-so, miss so-and-so. If you're missus, it's miss so-and-so, miss so-and-so. But, uh, but brother, what a, what a wonderful accepting name to be able to come into a church and be called brethren. Uh, there he called them the beloved here in verse 4. Uh, we understand we're the beloved with each other, but we're the beloved in Christ. Uh, and then he says, and the called. He said, uh, uh, let's see, uh, that your election of God, speaking of the called, uh, they're now part of the family of God. Just as Israel was chosen through Abraham, God just didn't randomly pick Abraham. God looked at Abraham and God picked Abraham, chose him uh, to lead Israel, Father Abraham. We understand now all those folks uh, that were in uh, Israel there were chosen that way. And then, and then the church was chosen through Christ. Understand, whosoever will may come. Who, sir, will may be part of the family of God. How many of you thank God for that? 
And then verse number 5, I could go on, but I will knock some chunks out here. They were receptive to the gospel. It It was an accepting place. They just readily accepted the gospel. If you go back and read Acts 17, you'll be shocked at the great number of people that came to the Lord in a short period of time. They're receptive to the gospel. And I want you to be praying as time goes on and as this thing kind of closes down that, that as we preach and as we teach and as we go soul winning in our community that people will open up and be accepting to the gospel. You ought to pray that. Number four. Number four. It was an exemplary place. An exemplary place. place. Verse six. Uh, he says, and, and you became followers of us. And of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost, so that we were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. Now, people who like to read out of funny Bibles, they like to change that word from in samples to examples. And it's in samples for a reason. Um, it is an it is English word in the Old English, is mood. From the Greek word that means echo. So they follow Paul's example in verse 6. And by the way, Paul taught in other places, follow me as I follow Christ. The man of God is not a follower of Christ. We have reason not to follow that man of God. Follow me as I follow Christ. But then the word in samples means is the is the word we get our word echo from. And Paul was their mold. Paul was their template. That's a pretty tall order. Can I just say this? It would make it a whole lot easier in Christianity in America today if you just look up to people. If you just find somebody in the church, you say, now that's a godly person. That's a godly lady. A godly man. And just kind of follow their example. We've got them here in our church. And I'm thankful for it. And there's nothing wrong with this. And... uh, they, the Bible says they were full of uh, joyful in their hearts, uh, in the spirit, amidst persecution and affliction, and they had joy uh, of the Holy Ghost. By the way, that's where true joy comes from anyway, the Holy Spirit of God. Now, I'm winding it down, so stick with me. We're going to make it happen. The Bible says here, uh, look at uh, verse number 8. It was also an evangelistic place. Verse 8. For from you... Watch this phrase. Sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. I'd love to just break that verse down there and just teach and preach the whole thing. Let me be brief. The Bible says they sounded out the gospel. Excuse me, that, that, that's the word that means echo. The word in samples means a mold or a template. But the word uh, sounded out means echo, which means the gospel echoed out the whole region of Macedonia, even south to the city uh, area called Achaia, and they saw the gospel spread abroad. Everywhere they had a good name of being an evangelistic church. Now here's what I want to say. I, I want our church to be that kind of church. I want, to, I want our church to be able to sound out or to echo or as, as we preach, as we teach, as we go out, as we knock on doors, as you with your families, as you're, you're with people down in the jobs. I want the gospel to reverberate, to echo from this place. That is a sign of a church that's prepared to meet the Lord. They're, they're active in evangelism. And uh, the Bible teaches us here that they saturated their area with the gospel. That's what we try to do. Our operation doorstep uh, is involved in that. Every door uh, in our city, 57,000 doors. Last I checked, we were nearing 10,000 doors. Let's stay at it, stay at it, stay at it. And then number six, it was an earnest place. It was an earnest place. Verse 9 says, they meant business. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God. They meant business. They separated from idols, and that was a big deal back then. Our missionary will, will go to a foreign field, and many of the people that will come to Christ will have to leave their pagan religions. But the Ferran is here. He's going into a heavily Catholic area. Idols everywhere. He's going to need the help of God 
to do that. But I'm going to tell you what, when they leave, when somebody gets saved and they leave that, that is a big deal. The Bible says it was an earnest place in that they served God. They separated from idols and they served God and they called him, watch this now, the living God and the true God. That was important in the regions of Macedonia because no one knew who the true God was. They didn't believe that he was a living God. And can I say, I remember when we went into Mongolia just to translate their, their Bible, they didn't even have a word for God. And they had to, through the Mongolian language, come up with a word, a word for our eternal God. And so uh, this was the case here. And, and they were earnest about serving God. They believed that Jesus Christ was alive. And then lastly, it was an expectant place. An expectant place. We read verse 10 together. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. They waited for the rapture. The son from heaven, the resurrected one, they believed that. And they lived like they believed that. They understood the coming wrath of God, a twofold meaning here. Uh, not just uh, the ultimate lake of fire, which burns forever and ever, but also the tribulation period. And he said, he said, and to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus Christ, which delivered us from the wrath to come. You ought to circle that word delivered. Jesus Christ is going to get us out of this mess. You say, how do they know that? The Apostle Paul came and taught that. We're being taught that tonight. So a church's reputation means everything. Of course, we want to have a good reputation in our community. But more than that, we want to have a good reputation in heaven before God. As I said, there are seven churches there that Jesus evaluated in Revelation 2 and 3. Here's what he said about one of the churches at Ephesus, the church at Ephesus. He says, and I quote, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. And he said some other things. But then he said this to the church of Laodicea, the last church, the seventh church. I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. And I would thou work cold or hot, so that because thou art lukewarm, neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth, because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods, and have need of nothing, and knowest not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. They didn't even see it. Now, here's my point. I'm trying to say that God knows the church. All seven churches, Jesus said, I know thy works. I know thy works. I know thy works. I'm talking tonight about a church that was prepared for heaven. Now, we know in their generation, they waited right up the last minute until they died for Jesus Christ to come back. And Jesus Christ did come back and catch them. Uh, in death and took them home to be with him but this is inspired scripture for us tonight the holy spirit of god wrote this for us so that you and i will be making preparation to go to heaven not preparation to stay here on planet earth because this world is not our home we're just passing through our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue and i want to challenge you that. let's stand together please our heads are bowed our eyes are closed tonight as a church i want to say this preacher as we enter into this particular study, I want to do a better job of making personal preparation.